Thank you. Next, we have Professor Stacy Stacy Davidson and Anne Austin. Um, Stacy is an Egyptologist and historian who teaches for the Continuing Education and History Departments at Johnson County Community College in Overland Park, Kansas. She's the co-founder and the first president of the American Research Center in Egypt's Missouri chapter, as well as the creator and team lead of the Egyptology State of the Field project. She received a 2021 Mellon ACLS Community College Faculty Fellowship for her interdisciplinary project, We Are for Egypt, which includes archival research and educators handbook and musical recordings. Her project produces an inclusive history of Southern Illinois, also known as Egypt or Little Egypt, and focuses on, chain, on the changing meaning of an Egyptian identity in the region. Anne is, uh, Stacey is presenting with Anne, who also lives in the United States. Anne holds a PhD in archeology span and her research combines biological and textual analysis in Egypt to better understand daily life, including healthcare practices, tattooing, and more. She also researches best practices in data reuse in archeology span and took up whittling during the pandemic, which is not a pandemic hobby I've come across. So that's absolutely fantastic. Stacey and Anne, thank you both very much. Please take it away. Thank you. Okay, hey, so um, as Megan said, my name is Stacey Davidson and I'm the creator and team lead of the Egyptology Stay of the Field project. I'm joined today by team member, Dr. Ann Austin. Before we begin, I would like to extend gratitude and appreciation for the SASA and Digital Hammurabi staff who have put in countless hours to organize this conference with the mindful intentions of accessibility and inclusivity by reducing financial and geographic barriers to attendance. The Egyptology State of the Field team are delighted to debut our project in this venue. Stacey, I'm not seeing yeah. your screen share. Um, that could be me. Can um, can anyone see? No, it's not up yet. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, yes. Okay. That's okay. You only missed the title slide. All good. Okay. Excellent. So this project began in the spring of 2020 during the global pandemic shutdown, but the roots of this project extend back many years to my time in graduate school. I was inquisitive then as I continue to be about the kinds of questions that required introspection and a critical look at what the field was, who the Egyptological professionals were and what sorts of jobs they held. I wanted to know how many people were active in Egyptology, the gender breakdown of scholars, the demographic makeup, how many Egyptology jobs are posted per year, how many Egyptology PhDs are awarded each year, and importantly, why so few scholars of African descent were professionally working in a field that consisted of studying an ancient African civilization. None of my questions were answered. As we were grappling with the Black Lives Matter movement and the racial reckoning that propelled issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion into mainstream conversations, it was clear that no more time could pass and the project needed to be launched. Collecting and analyzing demographic, educational, and occupational data is something that many professional societies in the humanities and STEM fields have done and continue to do on a regular basis. In order to create effective change, you must understand the status quo as well as identify areas for improvement. Two such organizations who regularly collect these data are the American Historical Association and the American Chemical Society. The AHA has robust series of publications regarding educational and occupational data about the historical profession. Two initiatives include the Directory of History Dissertations and where historians work. The Directory of History Dissertations includes 75,976 dissertations from 204 different history departments in the United States and Canada. And where historians work exemplifies the career outcomes of 8,523 historians who earned PhDs in the US from 2004 to 2013. There will be an update coming this fall, which includes 2014 to 2017 data. The American Chemical Society has made DEI work a major consideration in chemistry education and job preparation. Perhaps as a scientific society, the ACS was more willing to design surveys and studies, but they were also effective at analyzing the data they collected and using that data to affect change. One such example is the Bridge Program, which 
quote, aims to increase the number of Black, Latino, and Indigenous students earning doctoral degrees in the chemical sciences, unquote. No such database-backed initiative currently exists for Egyptology. Um, through a varying amount of studies over the years, um, including in 2019, there was an ACS salary survey in which chemists who identified themselves as Black represented 1.9% of ACS membership, while US Census data showed that 13.4% of the US population identified as Black or African American. In their member publication, Chemical and Engineering News, they regularly include articles on diversity and address the quote unquote leaky pipeline, which refers to the significant reduction of participation in the chemical fields as students progress higher in educational degree programs. In 2017, Dr. Carl Walsh and Mr. Justin Yu designed a survey aimed at studying the current state and future prospects in Egyptology and related fields for current PhD students and early career researchers. This is the first study of which I'm aware that highlighted the necessity for data collection, and I am eagerly awaiting their publication results. While their study was international and focused on PhD students and early career researchers only, the Egyptology State of the Field project focuses on American citizens, um, people who have gone through the United States higher ed system, and people who work in Egyptological careers in the United States, with the intention that this is not a definitive study, but a spark to launch a regular evaluation of the field and its scholars. We encourage other countries and regions to collect data and to find out the states of their fields. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my team. We coalesced organically. The team members include myself and Dr. Ann Austin, of course, Dr. Emily Cole, Jessica Johnson, Dr. Sarah Orell, Dr. Kathleen Shepard, Jason Silvestri, Dr. Jen Thumb, Dr. Julia Trochet, and Clara Wright. Uh, six of us were founding members of the Missouri chapter of the American Research Center in Egypt. And through our network of contacts, we were able to assemble a team that represented scholars from various stages including recent BAs and PhD students, to contingent faculty, to museum educators, to tenure track and full professors. We also represent a diversity of racial, ethnic, and religious backgrounds, first generation, rural, and low income scholars, scholars with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ community. We are currently spread out from California to Abu Dhabi. So you can imagine getting together for Zoom meetings was a little challenging, but always rewarding. What we all have in common is a desire to make studying and working in Egyptology more accessible, inclusive, and diverse. I'm exceedingly proud of each of my team members um, and their dedication to this project. And I would also like to say that we are all unpaid volunteers. And with the exception of a grant to help us transcribe audio interviews, we are also completely unfunded. So our outcomes are in three primary areas, education, diversity, and employment. This is kind of a broad um, amount of things that we want to tackle, and I think that it's very ambitious, but from our results in the survey and the interview round, we will be able to determine a path forward um, to be able to sample uh, other results. So our first, education. We are evaluating curricula with the hope of suggesting pedagogical reforms. We would also like to isolate challenges in the completion and retention rates for graduate students and early career scholars. In terms of diversity, we want to address inequities in historically marginalized populations and the lack of diversity in the field of Egyptology. And for employment, we want to identify roadblocks for graduate students and early career researchers in the Egyptological job market, as well as provide guidance for those seeking tenure track careers or careers outside academia. Uh, so in this slide, we have uh, our project stages. So in February 2021, we launched our survey. So we had begun meeting in the spring of 2020. Um, and over the course of that year, uh, we figured out what we wanted to ask on the survey, how we were going to do that, and also disseminating that out to different programs, professionals, personal contacts, social media, etc. The survey was done through the Qualtrics program, and it was also self-selected. So people were allowed to opt into the survey. Um, the issue with that is that we love our results and we love 
how many people participated, but we at this time do not know what percentage of that uh, is representational of the entire population of people who work with Egyptology in the United States because we don't have that data yet. Um, so the questions on our survey include demographic information. We ask about issues of inclusion, support and discrimination, graduate requirements and support, and also if people are currently working in Egyptological fields. So we can determine where those are and hopefully help the next generation um, get jobs. We recently concluded our interview stage, which is the second arrow here in May and June. So we had a sub team from our main team who took human subjects research training. Um, we also went through an IRB process to determine that we were exempt. So we're following all of the, the best protocols for human subjects research. We included uh, issues of informed consent. Um, we also allowed people to opt out at any time of both the survey and the interview process. Um, the interviews asked for more open-ended responses to issues about background and support prior to graduate school, mentorship and experiences in graduate school, as well as postgraduate career trajectories. We're currently in our data analysis phase where we are going through both the survey results and the interview results. Um, and currently we are doing a cleanup of our transcriptions. We will then do coding of the transcriptions so that we can analyze that data in along with the survey data. Uh, we are presenting today our first, uh, our first presentation of our project uh, in this venue. We will be continuing to uh, apply to other conferences. And the goal is that we will have an initial publication, hopefully next year, where we will release the data from the survey and the interviews. And in the future, we are going to invite other scholars to use our data. And Anne will talk about that a little bit more in a few, month, few minutes. So now I would like to turn this presentation over to team member Dr. Anne Austin to dive into the data. Thank you, Stacy. So uh, we just wanted to briefly introduce you all to one case study on our data that looks at our questions on race and ethnicity. But to give you a sense of what our overall results are, we had 203 people complete the surveys and meet our qualifying criteria. And we had uh, a goal of understanding Egyptology in the United States. So in terms of qualifying criteria, we required that people participating either uh, be or previously have been participant in a graduate program in the United States in Egyptology or have an Egyptology related job. For the graduate program, it doesn't have to be listed as Egyptology. It could be in a field adjacent to that. But our goal was to understand the entire structure of people who enter graduate programs and perhaps leave all the way through people who join uh, in a job related to Egyptology, perhaps having done graduate school elsewhere. So therefore we included uh, US citizens and non-US citizens in this survey. And in terms of follow-up, we gave people the opportunity to opt in to a follow-up interview. And we had 40 completed audio interviews we did that ranged of 45 minutes to about an hour um, with questions that were more focused on the qualitative topics that Stacy just discussed. Now, as I mentioned, I want to give a little bit of a dive into our questions on race and ethnicity, not just our results, but also the process by which we decided to ask this question and structure it. As you can see, the question that we posed to people combined the categories of race and ethnicity, and we provided the following options, Arab or Arab American, Asian or Asian American, biracial, Black or African American, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, or Latinx, Indigenous American, Native American, or American Indian, multiracial, Native Hawaiian and or Pacific Islander, white, prefer, prefer to self-describe um, or decline to answer. In structuring this question, we made sure that we had a uh, checkbox system so multi-boxes could be checked. Now I'd like to talk about how we structured that. So Stacy, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
one of the most important things for us was to be able to create a data set in Egyptology that was comparable to other major data sets. For example, we want to be able to compare our results with the US Census or with other data sets that collect information about higher education. To give you a sense of what it looks like in the most recent US Census, the census asked two questions related to this. One that was specifically about ethnicity, where the only options were to identify if you're Hispanic, Latino, or of Spanish origin. And then a second question focused on race, where you had the option to choose one or more boxes, with the boxes being white, black, American Indian, or Alaska Native, and then a larger set of boxes that indicated Asian nationalities and Pacific Islander nationalities. And then you've had a final box that said some other race. Once you check the box in the US Census, you then had to enter a write-in response beneath it. And that write-in response was specifically for if you check the boxes for white, uh, uh, black, and American Indian or Alaska Native. Under the white box, you had to include nationalities, and the examples they provided included Egyptian and Lebanese. Recently, in a Washington Post opinion piece by Dahlia Azim, she writes, uh, in the title of the post, I am Middle Eastern, not white, and explains that as somebody of Egyptian descent, it was the first time she was required to check a white box to indicate that she was Egyptian and how this felt incredibly uncomfortable for her. This was something we kept in mind as we are considering what the survey should look like. So while we wanted comparability to other major data sets, we also wanted to have applicability to Egyptology and the flexibility for the complex ways people define their own racial and ethnic identities. We therefore added an Arab or Arab American uh, checkbox, which is usually not included. We also had our preferred self-describe uh, area where people could enter information if they didn't feel anything of the above really applied to them. This meant that, for instance, if someone filling out the survey identified as Egyptian and none of those categories, they have a place to put it instead of having to enter themselves underneath another category. Next slide, please. And here are our results. These results are based on the number of boxes that were checked. Because we allowed people to check more than one box, anybody who identified as having more than one racial and or ethnic identity was able to select those. So while this indicates um, the overall rates that we have for our checkbox, keep in mind these data on this slide don't represent the overall rates per person. As you can see, uh, we have 74% white, but what I'd like to focus on this slide is actually instead of the ratios, kind of the representations that we're seeing. And as you can see, the preferred self-describe area had 4% of our checkboxes um, included that. I'd be happy in the Q&A to talk about some of the answers for that, but what's helpful for that is it gives us a sense of how representative our checkboxes were, were they working, was there a lot of data that we were missing. You can see uh, as we look across the representation, we have lower numbers between one and six percent. Um, as we look at Arab or Arab American, Asian or Asian American, biracial, Black or African American, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, or Latinx, Indigenous American, Native American, American Indian, multiracial, and then Native Hawaiian and or Pacific Islander. We did have one person indicate Pacific Islander in their uh, response in the fill in the, the blank. So there is one box that we could potentially add to that, but we have, as you can see, uh, very low numbers for some of those categories. Next slide, please. I think another way that's really helpful to look at these data though is by individual. So we reanalyze the data to look at uh, whether or not there is a single response or multi-response, and then broke down those numbers in the slide that you see here. And to give you a point of comparison, I like to indicate what the values are at the US census level. These aren't for the 2020 census since these data were just released two days ago, but uh, they are representative of the data published as of 2019. So I'm going to discuss moving left to right from uh, the multiracial percentage left to right for the U.S. Census data, and I'll give you those numbers. Didn't want to busy the slide too much, so you can see how Egyptology compares. So the numbers on the slide currently are from our survey. Here are the U.S. Census numbers. 3% of people identify as two or more races. 
Um, there was no option in the US Census for prefer to self-describe. 6% identify as Asian alone, 13% as Black or African American alone, 19% as Hisp Hispanic or Latino, 60% as white alone and not Hispanic or Latino. When you look at these numbers, you can see, for instance, areas where we have more representation in our survey and areas where we clearly have much lower numbers than what we compare to the US Census. Next slide, please. But what's nice about our survey, we had over 50 questions that we asked. So it gives us the flexibility to also explore how different questions interact with each other. One of the things we asked is if people had faculty positions and of the 87 people who responded yes, we gave them the option to identify what kind of faculty position they had. Uh, here's a distribution where you can see that we have a fairly large number of adjunct lecturers followed by a small number of non-tenure track faculty increasing from assistant to associate to full and then a small number of people responding as other. Again, I can explain what those responses were in the Q&A. Next slide. And here's what those data look like when we add in our race and ethnicity. Uh, what you can see from the slide is decline to answer is in green. So keep that in mind that uh, some people felt uncomfortable providing all of the data that we asked. In some cases, that might have been because they were worried about their anonymity. Even though we ensured anonymity, you can imagine in a field as small as Egyptology that once you start providing a certain amount of identifying information, it might be easy to kind of figure out who's being represented. Um, now, we've got uh, increasing numbers of overall um, rates of faculty as we go up, as we discussed in the last slide. But here you get a little bit more of a sense of where diversity is higher and where it's lower. For example, among people who self-identified as non-tenure track or other, we have exclusively white representation. But let's see what this looks like when we compare it to higher ed more broadly. Next slide, please. And this gives us a better sense of what we are looking at. For instance, here we can see that the number of overall adjunct and non-tenure track faculty in Egyptology is actually much higher than what we see in higher ed more broadly. And we can also see areas where representation is um, missing in Egyptology. For instance, the light blue color representing Hispanic, Latino or, Latino or Latinx is only represented in the adjunct and assistant professor level in Egyptology and nowhere else. Additionally, the yellow represents Black or African American, which across higher ed has much more representation than in Egyptology. Conversely, we actually have a much higher percentage of people responding as multiracial than what you tend to see in the 2018 survey of higher ed from the National Center for Education Statistics. Next slide. One final way to analyze that is by looking at the percentage single response white faculty by position across those two surveys. So basically, what percentage of people are exclusively identifying as white in those different positions? And to make it a little easier to read, I've put these data side by side with higher ed represented in blue and uh, Egyptology from our survey represented in orange. And here you can see that in general, Egyptology has higher representation of white, single response white faculty than what we're seeing in higher ed more broadly. Next slide. Now, these are just some preliminary results. We initially advertised our survey in February, but we are open to getting more respondents since, as Stacy mentioned, we actually don't even know the true number of Egyptologists in the United States. So if you haven't yet participated and you meet our qualifying criteria, consider spending just 15 minutes to expand our data set. The QR code on the screen will bring you uh, to our survey, but you can also go to our website, egyptologystats.org, to learn a little bit more about our project and to learn about our qualifying criteria. Next slide. In terms of our next steps, what we really want to do is to create a baseline data set that we can all use to explore where the field can go next to become more diverse and representative. So as we provide those data, our goal is to include a call for papers that encourages people that may not be represented in our team or whose opinions we really value in being able to increase representation in the field. We would love to have more participation of Egyptian Egyptologists, Egyptologists who are members of historically marginalized populations, 
scholars interested in pedagogical reforms, and professionals in alt at careers to contribute to help us understand how to make Egyptology more inclusive and diverse. And we'd also like to have all of our publications, including our initial results and these subsequent publications, open access so that people both inside the field and outside of it from a variety of backgrounds will be able to see what we've been able to publish on our project. Finally, we'd consider where we're going to go from there. So from the data and the publications, our team will decide the next stages for a project, including whether or not we want to have additional follow-up interviews or surveys about the field. Next slide. Um, so here are some of the links we referenced during our talk and final slide. We'd like to thank and acknowledge the Egyptology State of the Field team, the survey and the interview participants, as well as the different institutions and people we have consulted with and has helped us to put this together. And with that, we're open for any of your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. This seems like an incredibly important data set to get more information on. And I wish I could say I was surprised that it didn't already exist. Um, I have a question of my own. Um, what would you recommend as first steps for people looking to do this in Egyptological adjacent fields, say a seriology? Yeah. Um, we're happy to discuss, I mean, I will volunteer myself. If you have specific questions about how we determined um, what our process was, just contact me. Um, I think that first and foremost, probably um, demographic information would be useful as well as occupational information, where people are getting their degrees from and what they're getting them in, because not everyone who goes on into a graduate program for seriology, let's say, um, went to undergrad for that. So there's also this issue of access that we're looking at since so few universities and colleges offer Egyptology programs or any kind of focus, if it's called Egyptology, if it's called Near Eastern or Middle Eastern studies, um, what have you, there's already an access issue with um, the fact that there are so few programs and they're very highly selective. So that's also something that we didn't talk about um, very much today, but that we're looking at the transition of how people are even coming to these programs. And we captured some of that in our interview data. Lovely, thank you very much. And we have a question from the YouTube audience. Were you surprised by any of the results that you got? Um, I don't know. Anne, do you wanna take that one? Sure, I mean, I think the data that I just presented to you, I was not surprised at in terms of um, what I have experienced for race and ethnicity and representation in Egyptology, I wasn't surprised to see them, but what's important for us is to get them as that baseline because that can give us the opportunity in 10 years to look back and say, what direction are we going? As um, we asked, as I said, over 50 questions in the, the 15 minute survey, and we also did these follow-up interviews. And so I think when we get a chance to speak more broadly, there were some surprises uh, for me at least, especially as we start to analyze these, I think we're going to find some things that are unexpected um, just based on our own personal experiences. But I don't wanna get into that too much yet. I'm just gonna say uh, we'll be presenting as well at ASOR for those who can, and then we'll be happy to share some of our results as well on social media for those who can't attend um, to expand on what we've talked about today. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, before we move on to the next pre presentation, would you mind just taking a minute to talk about what kinds of responses you got in the, um, uh, I don't identify in any of these, your self uh, identification box? Yeah, we'll be happy to. Um, so I, we did have uh, one person identify that they were uh, Egyptian, which was not offered as an option, which I think is something that made me reflect too as well on like, would we have done this differently if we, you know, had a chance to review it? Um, we also have, let me just go. Uh, we also had um, people identify as being both white and Pacific Islander. We had somebody identified as Slavic or Greek. We had somebody identify as North African slash Egyptian slash Middle Eastern. Uh, somebody is Jewish American, American, someone is Armenian, someone is Hispanic, but from Spain, which I think is interesting because a lot of the surveys in the US don't even really provide that as an option. 
um, uh, somebody as Caucasian technically in their terms, and then Afghan American. So I'll, in a lot of these cases, I think it's when people have multiple multiple identities that they're they wanted to make sure that that was really represented, um, which is I think great feedback for us to have. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much. This was very interesting, and I'm I'm going to keep an eye on on where you go and probably email you, Stacey, because I think this is work that needs doing for a seriology as well. Oh, yes, yeah. please. I'm happy to answer ah. any questions and help how I can. Yeah. Thank well, you very much. Thank you.